Welcome to today's webinar on non-traditional security concerns in the new normal. Um, as we all know, we are living in very extraordinary times. We've had, we've been having the COVID-19 pandemic for the last year and a half now, and the disruptions to our lives have been uh, very um, extraordinary to say the least. A lot of, um, how should I say, a lot of people have been affected globally. Uh, I think the current uh, uh, death toll as of um, May um, 31st is 3.5 million death, but that is not to mention really the suffering and the misery that this pandemic has caused to millions of people around the world. But most importantly also, the pandemic has had a significant impact and disruption to our daily lives. And it, it has cross-cutting impact on uh, food security, on health security, the environment, uh, our own personal safety, uh, amongst others. To flesh out many of the impact of the pandemic and its, its uh, consequence or its significance to our, uh, our human security, we have three uh, speakers from the Center of Non-Traditional Security Studies here at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies. Um, we have, uh, allow me to introduce them. Uh, speaking on the topic of uh, the impact of the pandemic on economic um, on the economy and food security is uh, Jose Maria Luis Montes Claros, who is an associate research fellow here with the NTS Center of RSIS. He works on food security and has had a um, long experience in dealing with um, food security from different perspective and is currently one of the core principal investigators of an ASEAN project on the impact of digital technology on food uh, security. We also have Margaret Sabiring, who is uh, Associate Research Fellow too of the NTS Center, who works on climate change, governance and climate mitigation especially in low carbon transitions. Margaret is also the manager of the NTS Asia Consortium on NTS Studies, a consortium that brings together more than 30 institutes and centers in the Asian region. Last but not least, we have Julius Trajano, who is a research fellow here also at the NTS Center who works, among others, on nuclear security and safety. One of Julius's um, a recent appointment is being a member of the leadership team of the International Nuclear Security Education Network and also of the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific. So I am more than delighted to chair this um, afternoon's uh, webinar. This is actually the first of a two-part series. And without further ado, let me now turn to uh, Louis Montes Claros, who will talk to us about the impact of uh, the pandemic on food security, uh, sorry, on economic security and food security. Over to you, Louis. I'll now be talking about um, the impacts of the pandemic on food security by considering that it is a hybrid health and economic crisis. So the question I try to answer is, have you reached a new normal in Southeast Asia's food security? The brief intro, non-traditional security issues or challenges to the survival and well-being of peoples and states that arise out of non-military sources, often transnational in scope, defying unilateral remedies and requiring comprehensive responses from the political, economic and social perspectives. There are several examples, and what I'll be focusing on are uh, infectious diseases with security and economic security, and how these come together in the case of the COVID-19 pandemic. So here's my uh, outline. I'll start by defining what we mean by new normal, 
And I know that there are many ways of seeing a new normal. So this is just my take on it. Uh, I'll apply this to food security and cite examples of the impact of earlier new normals. So I'll, I'm trying to say that a new normal isn't necessarily the new normal. It can be a, a part of a series of many new normals. Then I go into the COVID-19 uh, impacts and I ask, is it new? And I ask, is it a new normal? So what do we mean by new normal in food security? So compared to the old normal, is there a significant impact in food security? And is it normal? Is it expected to stay? To understand this, I provide a framework for uh, assessing uh, new. So it, it begins with, uh, in the food security aspect, looking at food utilization. So undernourishment is a function of, based on the FAO's methodology, it's a function of uh, the calories available from the food you have in stock, which is based on food production, imports, prior food stock, and food waste. Uh, the second aspect of food security is economic access or food affordability. This is impacted by food import costs and food production costs and income inequality. Uh, this is further impacted on by logistics stability, for instance, if there are transport strikes uh, or congestion because of COVID, food trade stability uh, and food prices. The third aspect is physical availability, looking at logistics and food trade. And the fourth is food availability, focusing on global food production, which can be impacted by agricultural productivity and climate change. So using this framework, if it if a new normal picks any of these boxes, then it is considered as new. So I look at uh, several of the previous ones. You see climate changes and was a new normal before. Even before COVID, uh, it was a new normal where you saw a reduction in crop yields. Food trade fragility is also a new normal in food, uh, even pre-COVID, where we've had theories as of world food crises. Another is structural transformation where there has been a reduction in labor and agriculture and also share of GDP. Uh, there's also been a rise of the middle class and diet diversification towards meat consumption. And also the supermarket revolution where a greater share of total receipt is from supermarkets. And finally, we have entered the century of cities, uh, which brings urban food security challenges in bringing food to the table. Uh, by 2050, two thirds of the world are expected to live in cities. So this brings it its own challenges. So based on all of these, we see that Southeast Asia has reached its tipping point in 2014. After 2014, undernourishment has started to increase again within the region in terms of total numbers. So uh, we can see this also in each of the Southeast Asian countries where you see this slowing down in the progress in under uh, nourishment, uh, addressing undernourishment. And like you see like these U, U shapes or inverted uh, this, these U shapes. So this is what where we what we had before COVID-19 came. We now ask what is the impact of COVID-19? So for the remainder of my presentation, I'll focus on COVID-19. So COVID-19 is a hybrid health economic crisis. It is a health crisis because of the risk of asymptomatic transmission that makes the virus intractable. This novelty also creates a long gestation period before lock, uh, before vaccine, vaccines can be created. So you see that uh, here, um, most con ASEAN countries implemented international and domestic lockdowns. These have had important impacts on the economy through economic crises. And the IMF has referred to this period as the period of the great lockdown or the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression in the 1930s. What are its impacts on food security? I think that COVID-19 is new from the food security perspective because of these impacts. First, there are disruptions in the supply of labor and inputs to food production, which can disrupt cropping cycles. There have also been disruptions in access to markets to reduce transport capacity for food. There have also been limited access to food supplies at the local level, which have led to increasing uh, costs of food and consumers have also responded by hoarding food and producers by uh, price gouging. There have been pushes towards export restrictions during the COVID-19 period. 
And there have also been reduced production targets for farmers. So the farmer psychology is, if I anticipate that I may not be able to sell all my crops, I may reduce the amount of food that I want to produce. I have also added an urban lens because urban uh, COVID-19 is more really of an urban crisis, an urban health crisis. You have observed exponential growth in cases, and this can only happen in places of high density of interaction. So this places cities at the center. Today, we are entering a century of cities with over 41 mega cities of 10 million people or more. So this makes the impact of COVID-19 disproportionate on cities. So these are the potential implications. So it can impact on food affordability because COVID-19 impact on income and job, job security and also on migration that further affect housing and jobs. It can impact on food trade stability because of uh, transport uh, disruptions uh, and also logistic stability from extremism and riots. So it is also new from an urban perspective. So here are the potential policy implications to address each of these. To address uh, disruptions in the supply of labor and inputs, uh, we'd like, we should ensure sufficient access to food production inputs, explore digital procurement for timely access to these inputs, and also invest in controlled environment farming and biotechnology, which can allow crops to be more stable in the face of other threats like climate. To address disruptions, disruptions in access to markets, we should prioritize uninterrupted flows of food trade and expand the food storage capacity and explore e-commerce and digital marketing for farmers as well. To address uh, limited food at the urban and national level, uh, we should look at supply chain continuity agreements and exploring regional trading agreements that prioritize food sector. And finally, to address the reduced production targets of farmers, we should explore supporting farm farmer decisions with advisory services and subsidized financing, and also through partnerships with the private sector and universities. So you can see above what are the policies that have been implemented by countries. Uh, and the ones below are things that can be further explored, although some of them have been implemented by ASEAN as well. And finally, is it a new normal or not? <laughs> so my prognosis is it's still too early to tell. Uh, there, as you can see in this figure below, there have been further waves of the pandemic as it continues to evolve. Beyond COVID-19, there can also be other novel contagious diseases. And it is uncertain if vaccines can be developed in a timely manner if, or if we will have another one year lag before vaccines are developed. So the conservative answer is it is a potential new normal in the case of food security. And that the rest of it is actually beyond the food sector's control. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Over to you now, Prof. Yes, thank you, Louis. Uh, we had a bit of a problem with your audio, but I hope uh, we got most of your presentation. Uh, all right, uh, I guess we have an opportunity later on in the Q&A to ask you some questions. But thank you for highlighting the, um, the vulnerabilities that have been exacerbated as a result of disruption in food supply chain. But at the same time, also highlighting some of the possible policies that can be explored by countries in the region. And one of that really, as you have pointed out, is ensuring the uninterrupted supply of, uh, of, of food items. And at the same time, looking at the role of technology and the role of the private sector in ensuring that food security, um, that, that food uh, supply is basically ensured. Um, okay, so let me now turn to Margaret, uh, who will talk to us about, uh, to, uh, who will examine uh, COP26, reviewing some of the concepts that are critical in um, in uh, environmental and human security. So, Margaret, to you. Okay, um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. In this presentation, I will share with you uh, my observations of the different concepts and approaches to solving environmental issues with the aim of assessing whether the current mainstream approach is sufficient and in line with the kind of environmental issues confronting us today, especially as being brought into light by the COVID-19 which suggests that the current pandemic might have been a result of severe disruptions to the ecological systems. Um, as it stands now, it appears that the use of technology more than anything else 
is perceived to be a panacea for most, if not all, environmental issues. One can see it clearly in climate mitigation efforts where renewable energy development is deemed to provide the most fitting solution to the ever increasing greenhouse gas emission. Let us look at the upcoming COP26 in Glasgow later this year. This year's COP26 um, is important and significant for at least two reasons. One is because we are now in a decade where the world needs to halve its emissions by 2030 if we were to be on track to limit global temperature rises to 1.5 degrees. And second, because this is the time when countries will update their nationally determined contributions or NDCs as requested by the Paris Agreement um, five-year um, ratcheting up mechanism. In the two events that uh, preceded COP26, namely the Climate Ambition Summit organi organized late last year and the Leader Summit on Climate uh, convened by the US President Joe Biden in just over a month ago, countries were invited to make and express more ambitious commitments in their NDCs and to set out pathway to net zero emissions. Low carbon energy transition is seen as a key solution and the use of technology is undoubtedly a central element, which necessitates financing assistance, especially in developing countries. A transition to renewable energy sources is also touted to bring economic benefits. These efforts fit in to uh, COP26, which has a similar agenda, particularly for net zero goal, COP26 calls to accelerate coal phase out, curtail deforestation, speed up the switch to electric vehicles and encourage investment in renewables. We can see here as highlighted in green, the heavy emphasis on climate mitigation efforts and as highlighted in purple, the heavy use of technology in making that mitigation happen. While all this development is encouraging, the problem confronting the world today is unfortunately bigger than climate change. Last year, in light of the COVID uh, pandemic, the United Nations Environment Program highlighted that we are now facing triple planetary crisis and climate change is just one of the three. What I perceive as a potential issue here is that the ongoing drive to solve uh, climate problems through technological solutions may actually not completely, completely be in line with the solutions to the other two issues. The Global Biodiversity Outlook 5 released last year, which reports on the problems confronting nature as a whole, says the following. Climate change impacts undermine ecosystem resilience and weaken the contribution of ecosystem to both mitigation and adaptation of climate change. The large scale use of certain forms of renewable energy may in some cases further exacerbate these risks. And then further on the document says, the phase out of fossil fuels requires the development of, of alternative renewable energy sources, as well as improved energy efficiency. Inevitably, renewable energy, as well as some adaptation measures, have potential impacts on biodiversity. This suggests that there is a potential disconnect between the current mainstream trajectory towards renewable energy development in response to climate issues and the wider environmental problems that are becoming increasingly relevant in our world today. With this in mind, I investigated the origins of the mainstream approach to handle environmental issues as seen in the UN Conference on the Human Environment Health in 1972 and the UN Conference on Environment and Development or the Rio Summit in 1992, and then contrasted them with the various alternative views that are available out there with the hope of generating discussions to say the least of integrating other concepts and means that may complement current approaches and make them more relevant to, the, to solve the issues at hand. The UN Conference on the Human Environment in 1972 was the first global conference on environment ever held. The declaration that ensued showed that there was an acknowledgement of the harms that men inflicted on the environment, then, then, then that there was an urgent need to safeguard natural resources, maintain, restore, and improve the capacity of the earth, conserve nature, and guard against the exhaustion of non renewable sources. The approach, however, was human centric whereby economic growth and development must not be hindered by environmental considerations. That, that in fact needed to be encouraged while putting environmental safeguards in place. 
at that time, this approach was challenged, so to speak, by at least two documents that looked at the environment from the perspective of the environment itself. First is the Limits to Growth by the Club of Rome and a Blueprint for Survival by the Ecologist. The Limits to Growth says this, if the present growth trends in world population, industrialization, pollution, food production, and resource depletion continue unchanged, the limits to growth on this planet will, re will be reached sometime um, within the next 100 years. The most probable result will be a rather sudden and uncontrollable decline in both population and industrial capacity. Blueprint for Survival says, Gross domestic product or GDP, which is population multiplied by material standard of living, appears to provide the most convenient measure of ecological demand. The world cannot accommodate this continued increase in ecological demand. Indefinite growth of whatever, whatever type cannot be sustained by finite resources. This is the nub of environmental predicament. In other words, as early as in the 1970s, Alternative approaches to solving environmental issues from the perspective of the environment have been tabled. And as far as timeline is concerned, we are soon entering 50 years since all these debates took place. And as far as reality on the ground is concerned, we are now facing triple planetary crisis. The subsequent Global Conference on Environment and Development or, or the Rio Summit that took place in 1992 came up with a comprehensive plan of action, the Agenda 21. Among other things, the, documents, the document calls for a consideration to be given to the present concepts of economic growth and the need for new concepts of wealth and prosperity, which allow higher standards of living through changed lifestyles and are less dependence on the Earth's finite resources and more in harmony with the Earth's carrying capacity. The Rio Summit saw the birth of three conventions, the UN Convention on Bio Biological Diversity, the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, and the UN Convention on Climate Change, which are intrinsically linked, operating in the same ecosystems and addressing interdependent issues. We can see here, therefore, that the attempt to address environmental problems in a holistic manner is already there in the last 30 years. And if I may repeat myself, we are still facing a triple planetary crisis today. Various um, Alternative concepts have been expressed since the time of limits to growth and a blueprint of survival in the 1970s. Integral ecology, for example, puts the blame on the current system of economic development that places a premium on quick financial gain, maximization of profits and unlimited material progress at the expense of nature and the protection of the environmental ecology. It believes in the well-being of both human and natural environments and calls for moral principles in governing their administration and use and a change in models of global development. Planetary health capitalizes health ben benefits to push for stronger environmental actions. It puts the blame on economic and development gains that have resulted in changes to the structure and function of the Earth's natural system, which then present a growing threat to human health. It advocates for wise policies to manage natural systems, and steward the bio biosphere within safe planetary limits of change that can help to that can help to safeguard future human health. Steady state economic concept responds directly to the supposed root causes of the problem, which is economic growth, and proposes a different economic model based on ecological considerations. It envisions an economy of constant populations of people and constant stocks of capital that also has a constant rate of throughput which is energy and materials used to produce goods and services. It aims to get the scale of the economy right. An economy can reach a steady state after a period of, of growth or after a period of downsizing or degrowth. To be sustainable, they say, a steady state economy may not exceed ecological limits. Another one is donut economics, which presents another direct response to the perceived root causes of environmental problems proposes economic concepts that consider the need of both the planet and humans for well-being and prosperity. It challenges the current economic model that constantly pursues economic growth and calls for an agnostic attitude towards it and formulates a model that makes us thrive within planetary limits instead. The, the dilemma we are facing right now may be best summarized this way. We are fixated with the mission of getting the world into a state of carbon neutrality by 2015, and we are mainly employing technologies to do the job. At the same time, we are hoping to live in harmony with nature by 2050, 
and the large scale use of technology solutions may not actually lead us there. This is implicitly acknowledged in a recent report released just a few days ago that estimates a need for 8.1 trillion US dollars investment in nature-based solutions by 2050 to tackle triple planetary crisis. How are we going to re reconcile this? Well, alternative views are available and they may be able to complement the current mainstream technology-based approach to climate and other environmental issues. The challenge is, however, in how to bring these ideas in closer conversations with policymakers, either in multilateral setting or in natural setting, most especially in light of the current pandemic that highlights the urgency to reconcile environmental health and human health. With this, I will conclude and I thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret, for uh, walking us through, well, a number of concepts that have evolved over the years. One of the things that this pandemic has caused us is the fact that uh, it has basically brought not only the urgency of dealing with trying to get a, uh, you know, reigning in this pandemic, but at the same time also giving us the opportunity to actually rethink some of the major problems out there. And what Margaret has done, and many of those uh, in the climate uh, uh, security agenda, is to, um, is, is to remind us that there's a bigger problem aside from the pandemic that really confronts humanity today, and that is the need to actually deal with uh, the looming threat of climate change. But in doing so, Margaret has also flagged the, um, how to say, the wicked problems of climate change when we have to look at the difficult balance of trying to, do, uh, to, uh, to merge, bring together the different solutions, uh, maintaining economic growth, at the same time protecting the planet, protecting the environment, and all the different pathways to addressing this issue. I guess we have more answers, um, we have more questions than answers. And we shall also, of course, be dealing with some of your questions when we come to the Q&A session. Let me now turn to uh, Julius, who will remind us about the importance of peaceful use of nuclear energy in spite of the raging pandemic facing us today. So over to you, Julius, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Meli, and thank you to Louis and Margaret for uh, laying down the problems that we are facing. Hopefully my discussion, uh, I, can, I can highlight one potential uh, solution or among many solutions that can be used to, to the problems that uh, Louis and Margaret cited in their presentation. So basically, uh, if you remember last year, uh, many countries, including several Southeast Asian countries, uh, struggled to increase their testing capacity for the COVID-19 pandemic. And among the COVID-19 testing technologies that uh, is available right now is the real-time reverse transcript, transcription polymerase chain reaction or real-time RT-PCR. And it is actually, according to the International Atomic Energy Agency, it is actually a nuclear-derived method for specific detection of viruses and pathogens that are present in humans and animals. So because of this problem last year and maybe un until this year, the IAEA has stepped up and provided COVID-19 testing capability assistance to 128 requesting countries. And this highlights the other non-power peaceful applications of nuclear uh, technology, especially in health, uh, in public health. And as we all know, rapid and accurate COVID-19 testing is a key element of any effective national strategy to keep COVID-19 cases under control. Nuclear-derived detection techniques such as the real-time RT-PCR have been used in the rapid detection and identification of viruses that are causing some of the world's most dangerous diseases in the recent past, such as the avian flu, Ebola, and Zika virus, and Zika. And for over 50 years, the use of nuclear technology in medicine and nutrition has become one of the most extensive peaceful applications of nuclear technology. And the development of nuclear-derived detection kits by the IAEA exemplifies the crucial role of other international organizations apart from the World Health Organization in times of, of, a, of a global health crisis. <clears throat> 
While the IAEA is a specialist body with, expert, with expertise in nuclear technology and nuclear energy for peace and development, it does not have a broad mandate on health. However, it does have the mandate and capability to transfer, to, to transfer technology to help save lives. For instance, the agency responded quickly to the Ebola crisis in West Africa in 2014 by providing nuclear-derived diagnostic kits and laboratory supplies for use in the field. In 2016, the IAEA, in partnership with the Food and Agriculture Organization, assisted member states to deploy sterile insect technique, um, a mosquito control system that uses radiation to help stem the Zika outbreak. This latter technique is also used now to combat, under, to combat other mosquito-borne uh, diseases. Now, for COVID-19, the agency, the IAEA, equipped many other countries which initially did not have their own detection technique and capability. And 128 countries have received COVID-19 uh, equipment from the International Atomic Energy Agency, including countries in Southeast Asia. 286 national health laboratories and institutions have benefited from the IAEA technical cooperation support during the pandemic and close to 2,000 uh, RT-PCR and diagnostic kits were provided to requesting countries. Now, the IAEA's uh, ex extensive experience in addressing zoonotic outbreaks and transboundary animal diseases provides the foundation for a new initiative uh, launched by the IAEA in 2020. It's called the Zoonotic Diseases Integrated Action Program or ZODIAC. Launch last year, it aims to enhance interactions between science, policymakers, and society by promoting collaboration to identify risks and address outbreaks of zoonotic diseases with the use of nuclear-derived detection uh, technology. This effort is aimed at improving disease surveillance and response capabilities of countries to prevent uh, future pandemics or future outbreaks caused by bacteria, parasites, fungi, or viruses that originate in animals and can be transmitted to humans using an integrated research approach and nuclear-derived techniques. Now, apart from the, the public health uh, application, another non-traditional security issue where nuclear technology has a role to play is marine environmental protection. Marine plastic pollution uh, has actually has worsened since the COVID-19 pandemic. Nuclear technology uh, provides a sustainable and scientific approach to tackling this environmental problem. Plastic waste from mismanaged disposal of single-use face masks, which we wear every day, uh, gloves, and other personal protective equipment used during, the, during this pandemic has actually ended up choking our oceans. Its complex consequences may last even, even beyond this pandemic. And the worsening plastic pollution in our oceans is a critical area where nuclear technology can play an important role and provide innovative alternative solutions to conventional approaches. And even before the pandemic, before the COVID-19, marine plastic pollution was already posing an existential threat to marine wildlife ecosystems, food safety, and human health globally. Marine pollution is an issue of global concern, in particular for countries in Southeast Asia that rely on fisheries as a source of food and income. Every year, about 8 to 12 million metric tons of plastic debris find their way into the oceans, including microplastics. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, plastic pollution uh, I've, uh, as I've said, has actually uh, worsened. And a report by a marine conservation organization, uh, Oceans Asia, estimated that 1.56 billion face masks had entered the oceans in 2020 alone. And it will take 450 years, 450 years, for these face masks to uh, disintegrate, to degrade, and gradually disintegrating into more hazardous mark microplastics while endangering marine wildlife. And in the region, five Southeast Asian countries, namely Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam, 
have been listed as among world's top 10 contributors of mismanaged plastic waste. And collectively, they generate 8.9 million metric tons of mismanaged plastic waste annually. How can nuclear technology help address marine plastic pollution? Many studies have already documented the impact of large plastic debris on the marine environment. However, further studies are still needed to provide reliable and accurate assessment of the, of the potential damage caused by microplastics, which can be ingested by marine animals, including fish that we eat. So nuclear techniques can play a critical role, specifically radioactive isotopic tracer techniques can help scientists understand how microplastics get contaminated by toxic pollutants and how they transfer such pollutants to marine organisms and to the food chain and eventually to our stomach. Another area where uh, nuclear technology can make an impact is in the recycling and reduction of plastic waste. When conventional methods of recycling of plastic waste are no longer possible, radiation technologies can be used to recycle, to recycle uh, plastic waste into new commercially viable plastic items, thus generating economic benefits while reducing waste volumes. And just like in the COVID-19 pandemic, the International Atomic Energy Agency is at the forefront of deploying nuclear science and technology to address plastic pollution. Last year, the agency launched a new in initiative, the Nuclear Technology for Controlling Plastic Pollution Project, or NUTEC Plastic, which intends to explore and rapidly expand the use of nuclear technology to fight plastic pollution in the oceans and reduce plastic waste globally. Nuclear uh, technology can help in assessing and understanding the dimension of the microplastic problems, but also in the recycling of plastic through radiation techniques, which allow us to produce materials that can be further used uh, under the concept of a plastic circular economy. Now, many ASEAN, Southeast Asian countries are already implementing national policies and strategies to mitigate the impacts of marine plastic debris and to curve marine plastic pollution. Several of them also have pledged to participate in the IAEA's New Tech Plastic Project. The integration of the New Tech Plastic Project with their plastic, with the National Plastic Waste Control Programs will certainly enhance their respective national action plans, which all promote the deployment of innovative scientific solutions. Similarly, using, utilizing nuclear te technology can definitely advance the implementation of the ASEAN Framework of Action on Marine Debris and the ASEAN Regional Action Plan for Combating Marine Debris, which was uh, released last week, to, and both encourage both of these uh, action plans and framework of action from ASEAN, they both encourage ASEAN member states to promote and enhance science-based decisions and innovative technological solutions on marine plastic waste reduction and management. So the region has a growing pool of local nuclear scientists who can collaborate with other relevant environmental scientists and policymakers to develop and apply technologies for plastic waste control. Plastic pollution is a problem as big as the ocean. Hence, support and contribution from different stakeholders are critical in tackling marine plastic pollution. The region's nuclear technology research and training centers should therefore be part of the multi-stakeholder collaboration, which is critical in searching for innovative scientific solutions. Now, ASEAN member states have conveyed their interest to participate in these two important initiatives of the International Atomic Energy Agency, the Zodiac Project and the NUTEC Plastic. The Zodiac Initiative offers Southeast Asian countries access to novel technologies for early detection of emerging or re-emerging zoonotic diseases and its impact on human health. Participating countries will also have, have access to the IAEA's coordinated response team for zoonotic diseases. Meanwhile, new tech plastic uh, initiative could also benefit ASEAN members. The ASEAN IAEA practical arrangements on the peaceful uses of nuclear technology is a useful framework for knowledge and technology transfer to Southeast Asian nations. And we, sh we should therefore maximize 
the growing regional cooperation in nuclear safety, security, and technology spearheaded by the ASEAN Network of Regulatory Bodies on Atomic Energy, known as ASEAN TOM, which is, which is the key uh, uh, driver of regional cooperation in anything related to the peaceful use of nuclear technology in Southeast Asia. And it's a, it's a recognized uh, sectoral body under, under the ASEAN political security community. The, the applications of nuclear technology in addressing various NTS issues uh, such as health security, environmental problems are indeed robust. Nuclear technology is also widely used in the agriculture, in the industry, and scientific research. With this, it is critical that nuclear technology, in particular nuclear and radi radiological materials, are secure. And that is the uh, relevance, its relevance for nuclear security. There is a need to ensure that these uh, materials used for peaceful purposes do not get into the hands of people who have malicious and criminal intentions. Hence, nuclear security regime has to be strengthened as we expand the use of nuclear technology in addressing many of the global issues and problems that we have. Adequate regulatory oversight on the use, transport, and handling of uh, radioactive materials and strong nuclear security detection architecture are therefore relevant. ASEAN TOM, which is the uh, a, a key driver of regional cooperation in nuclear security in Southeast Asia, has been conducting regional capacity building projects on nuclear sec security for all member states in collaboration with the IAEA, the European Union, and other external uh, partners such as the United States, Republic of Korea, Japan, China, Australia, Canada, and among others. And we have seen gradual progress in updating relevant nuclear security policies uh, and ratification of relevant treaties by ASEAN countries through the years. But there are certain key challenges to nuclear security in the region in terms of low awareness among key stakeholders, gaps in national legislative frameworks, inadequate resources in many aspects, capacity issues, among others. So regional cooperation would, sig would significantly help enhance nuclear security in the region. In conclusion, building on the growing regional cooperation in nuclear safety and security, ASEAN countries can explore innovative solutions to many of the non-traditional security issues from disease detection to reducing marine plastic pollution with safe, secure, and peaceful uses of nuclear science and technology. That concludes my uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Julius. Um... Um, thank you for reminding us that uh, when we look at the subject of nuclear technology and security, we're not only worried about the safety of nuclear power plants or the problem of nuclear um, proliferation, but also that when we look at nuclear technology, it actually has very important uses in addressing many of the challenges that we face today. I think the information that you shared with us on what it can do in helping disease surveillance, right? And detection is I think very important. Also the, uh, the usage of nuclear technology in dealing with a very serious problem, which is linked to climate change and environmental security, which is actually the marine debris pollution. And thank you also for underscoring that when we look at nuclear technology, oversight and governance are critical, critically important because we need to protect right, the kind of technology so that we're able to use it for peaceful uh, purposes. So um, with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have three presentations from the uh, researchers from the Center for Non-Traditional Security uh, Studies here at RSIS. We will now turn to the question and answer session. Uh, I invite you to please send in your question and type it in the Q&A uh, button that you have uh, on your uh, screen. And I shall endeavor to read um, uh, your questions as much as I can, given that we, I think we have another 30 minutes. And if you like, you can in your question, uh, identify the, the speaker that you would like to address uh, your question to. Um, let me uh, uh, start with a very um, interesting question, which I think uh, applies to, uh, and can be addressed by all three of you. 
uh, when you talk about you know, the new normal and having to deal with disruption, uh, Kok Liang Chu has, uh, has this question to ask, if the Spanish flu pandemic is any guide, wouldn't the world go back to business as usual with collective amnesia of COVID-19, except for academics and scientific interest? So anybody, I think you can uh, take uh, some time to address this question. I mean, you know, after this pandemic is bound to end somehow <coughs> with vaccines and, you know, but, and after that, is it back to business as usual? So anyone who wants to take this, uh, shall I start with uh, Margaret, uh, uh, Louis, and then on to Julius. Margaret, do you want to say something? Yeah. yeah uh, thank you, Prof. And uh, thank you, Yang Chu, for the interesting question. So I think um, um, to a certain extent, you, you are right. I think um, there are things that will go back to normal, but I think there are things that will probably not go back to normal. Uh, and I personally think when it comes to um, environmental issues in which climate change is, is, is one of them, um, I think the, the push uh, rather um, to, to actually um, find real solutions to the problem um, will be there regardless um, of things going back to normal probably in other areas. Um, not least because um, the processes in the in the COP uh, are ongoing. Um, we can see, for example, um, low carbon transitions are happening in, in many countries, albeit um, you know, uh, in the speed and scale that probably not many people uh, would like to see. Um, and, and, and also other initiatives are ongoing because many of these issues are already there. I mean, were already there prior to the pandemic and um, are only going to uh, get um, uh, more significant or more relevant um, because of the pandemic. So I would say that climate and, and environmental issues uh, fall into that category. Thank you. Uh, we? Yeah. Um, thank you for that uh, question, uh, Kok Kiang. Um, I think that what happened in the case of the Spanish flu is that the world saw it as an abnormal, a new abnormal. They didn't expect or anticipate that the same thing would happen again in the future because at that time, maybe there was limited information on what drove this dynamic. In contrast, in the case of the COVID-19 pandemic, there have been uh, previous studies that have shown, for instance, antimicrobial resistance or the adaptation of uh, bacteria to treatments. Uh, so there is scientific basis for thinking of COVID-19 pandemics and future novel contagious diseases as part of the new normal, I would say. So I think that uh, this collective amnesia happens because of ignorance, but in the case of the COVID-19, there is less ignorance today, uh, thanks to the developments in the healthcare sector. And I think this also highlights the role of uh, academia in framing these issues as such. The framing of the new normal, I think, is is important uh, in this regard. Thank you, Julius. Over to Julius, you. Julius, yeah. Uh, for me, I think the there will be no collective amnesia this time around. Uh, first of all, the technological solutions, whether in the how we adapted <clears throat> to the pandemic, uh, is already widely available now as compared to the. Uh, 20th century when the Spanish flu hit the world. So I would not think that there will be, uh, that we will just simply forget what happened, at least our generation. And there's plenty of, uh, I mean, it has, this, this pandemic has been well documented already. Uh, and it's also good that there's an ongoing debate uh, uh, as to the origins of the COVID-19. So because, uh, this debate is always good in terms of, you know, unearthing the the real real origin of COVID nineteen, and it will always, uh, I mean, seeking the truth will always uh, produce, you know, uh, documents and uh, their scientific uh, papers, and it, 
the scientific papers, this uh, uh, the role of the academics uh, like us, <laughs> will uh, documenting the lessons from the pandemic will always serve as a reminder, maybe a painful reminder or otherwise to that the COVID that we have learned so much from the COVID nineteen pandemic and simply going back to the pre pandemic uh, attitudes and behavior behavior. Uh, will uh, make more harm. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, if I could weigh in here, I think, um, whereas before, as, as uh, our speakers have mentioned, you know, we, we didn't have as much information. Uh, I think one, one important note, if I may add to the conversation, is that if you compare 2019 to 2020, uh, we are certainly living in a much more connected environment. And that is why this pandemic has really hit globally and the consequences are as severe and as devastating. And the fact that uh, we really have the tools uh, in our hand with technology, et cetera. In fact, there's too much information <laughs> that we sometimes, you know, unless, you know, we, the, the challenge therefore is to be able to shift through all this information so that to make sense. And to, I think more importantly, to, to impress the importance really of adopting certain behavior and certain standards to avoid this kind of disaster that has appended our lives now for over a year. Uh, so uh, we generally hope that, um, you know, that we are not going to have a general amnesia because the, the impact has been so deep and so severe that uh, and also the the um, you know the the, peop the 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 number of people that have lost their lives is really, I mean, it will definitely go into the annals of history as to what we should do and what we cannot do moving forward. So a number of questions here. Let me try to cluster them based on the topics that uh, the, that have been dealt in this session: climate change uh, and food security, and of, and also. Um, and of course, the uses of nuclear technology. Um, to Margaret, um, there's a question, how has the pandemic influenced people's preferences towards the concepts that, that you have mentioned? For example, uh, is there more interest, for example, in the framing of climate change towards planetary health or something like that, right? And, um, and similar to that, if you also address when you talk about all these different concepts that have emerged, highlighting whether it's planetary, planetary health or sustainable development, etc., do you think, according to a question here, that more investments need to be made in nature based solutions rather than mainstream technology based solutions? Okay, okay, so uh, maybe you, you can choose to answer any of those questions, I guess. Okay, yeah. uh, thank you, Prof, and thank you for, for the questions. So I think um, generally, generally there is an increased um, um, attention given to uh, the concepts such as planetary health because of the pandemic, because people can see the direct relevance um, that the, the conditions of the environment can have on human health. Um, the concept itself was uh, introduced um, first, I mean, uh, formally introduced first in 2015, so that was over five years ago, and, and now it's becoming uh, uh, more and more, uh, you know, how to say, relevant. Uh, the WHO um, using, uh, is, is, is obviously using this um, uh, opportunity to promote the idea, but whether or not um, planetary health concept um, goes straight into the quote unquote, um, mainstream uh, climate um, uh, mitigation efforts, that remains to be seen. Because uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, 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 how to say, the dominant approach um, has been and still is uh, the technological uh, sol solutions to, to things, which is uh, the renewable energy de development. So we, we see, we see how things will, will proceed from now on, but yes, the, the concept is gaining uh, uh, more attention now because of the pandemic. Uh, so the, to the second question, I think it is not a matter of uh, choice. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I think at the UN level, uh, that, that report that I cited, by the way, was, um, uh, uh, was highlighted by uh, UNEP. So they themselves 
know that you know uh, uh, nature-based solutions um, are no longer just an option. It's it's it's, it's probably becoming a, a real necessity from now on. So I think the the, the questions here now is that um, can we do both, uh, you know, uh, low carbon energy transition and uh, nature-based solutions uh, together if we do not actually touch the root cause of the problem, which is economic growth, according to the, the concepts and studies that have been tabled uh, there for years. So that is actually um, the, the main question that I myself uh, uh, is, is, uh, still trying to find solutions and, and answers to. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Um, a question to Louis, we have two here. Um, one is, how do we cater to farmers and food producers who are not digi digitally literate or they do not have access to digital infrastructure, for example, for e-commerce? Because in your presentation, you talked as one, you, you mentioned that one of the, uh, the solutions to, you know, to mitigating the impact of, of of pandemics among others on food security is really using technology. So what happens to those who don't have access to di digital infrastructure and are not digitally literate? And I think following that, if I could also ask you uh, a related question raised by Sunny Tababa, um, how, does, how can trade better respond or contribute to sustainable food systems. So two questions, digital technology and the use of trade to contribute to food systems. Louis? Yeah. Thank you, Rob. Uh, so uh, thank you to Christopher for that first question on digital, uh, mm -hmm. digital access uh, to uh, smallholder farmers. Uh, I think I can address that with three concepts of capability, desire, and resources. Mm -hmm. On the capability side, uh, indeed, like farmers are becoming are aging and becoming less tech savvy, so there is potential for farmer education through partnerships with uh, universities and the private sector, and also the government local uh, extension uh, services. Uh, also, on capability, it's partly one possible way forward is to alter the farmer profiles. What's happening in China now is. You have youth from the urban sector returning to the rural sector because they're seeing the viability of, of jobs there. So bringing the youth back from rural, from rural to urban uh, is another way of doing that. Uh, the next aspect is desire. Um, farmers may not adopt technologies if they don't see the use case for it. Uh, for instance, um, we can already see some farmers in the Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia who are selling their products online or through government-provided uh, e-commerce uh, databases, like Malaysia's Agro Bazaar Online. So uh, some of them are also participating in Facebook through uh, live auctions. So I think if the farmers wanted to do it, then it's possible. And the role of the private sector is to encourage farmers towards this. For instance, in China, uh, Pindodo has tapped 12 million farmers, uh, which is practically the size of that is like 10% of ASEAN's farmers. So 12 million farmers in uh, e-commerce, because the farmers saw that if I engage in this, if I learn this new skill, then I can uh, sell more products online. I can understand the market trends better. So uh, there has to be the desire. The third part is resources. Um, I think public investments are limited because of a chicken and egg problem. If they don't see farmers being able to use the digital technologies, then they will not also invest in uh, internet connectivity or electricity in far-flung areas. So I think an incrementalist approach is needed, focusing on early wins first uh, to show that in places that are already uh, connected, um, e-commerce e and agriculture can increase farmer incomes. After that, it's just a matter of replicating it because the uh, governments will have seen that there is a financial case for it. Uh, and uh, finally, just to address the question on trade, um, I think that uh, trade creates an incentive for adopting technologies. Uh, an exa a negative example is the Philippines. During the first green revolution, the Philippines 
uh, implemented a revaluation of the peso, um, making Philippine exports more expensive. So that limited the markets of Philippine farmers to the local markets only. Unlike uh, Vietnam and Thailand, uh, Vietnam especially, who did not apply that policy. So for the Vietnamese farmers, their market was the whole world. As for the Philippines, it was just the Philippine market. So by expanding the markets, farmers can be better incentivized to adopt technologies. Because otherwise, if it's just the local market that they're looking at, the more they increase their productivity, the lower the prices become. So they're basically shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a question about, um, I, there's a point made here about the agenda for COPS 26 uh, by Salil Sin. He says, uh, climate nature pollution is impacted by civil and armed conflicts. Uh, civil, uh, cars, transport, air cons, et cetera, impact through the re uh, impact release of CO2 and will have significant footprint. And of course, armed conflict, you know, millions of times of lethal global warming emission. Uh, but this is not uh, dealt with, um, has not, you know, in, in COP26. So what, what is your opinion on this, Margaret? I mean, um... <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh, for, for the very interesting question. Yeah. Okay. So I personally think that you are right, uh, that just like all other sectors, I think the defense sector also need to green itself. Uh, it needs to look inside and see uh, how how they can make their operations more environmentally friendly, uh, and, and obviously, you know, um, avoiding um, uh, open armed conflicts will be the best way of, uh, you know, uh, 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 avoiding um, emissions. Put it that way, right? I mean, so, but yeah. So yeah, I agree with you that you you brought up a very uh, interesting and important point there. But I think the problem is. Uh, because armed conflicts are not shared in, in all countries, um, you know, bringing this issue up to multilateral um, discussions such as COP may be a real challenge. Um, countries will uh, be more comfortable talking about shared issues, just like you said, you know, um, transportation, energy, and, and things like that. But armed conflicts may happen in countries A, B, C, but not D, E, F. So it, it's it's hard to bring it there. But Yes, generally, I agree that um, defense sector needs to look into themselves and, and see how they can um, can uh, mitigate emissions uh, in, 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 in their sector. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I could chime in here, uh, if you put too many things on the table, then there's going to be a, uh, how do you say, <laughs> an overload of the agenda. And instead of making small progress, perhaps taking small steps that could even hinder uh, progress, but nonetheless, the importance of in, uh, in understanding one of the things that we do in the center is actually to draw linkages of many of these issues. But in being able to draw linkages helps in the understanding. But I guess when it comes to advancing solutions and getting countries to work together, we just have to break it down into what is realistic, but bring it down into bite sizes <laughs> for countries to deal and work together. In relation to that, uh, there's a question here, and I guess, uh, you know, um, it doesn't have to be Margaret, Julius can also chime in here if you like. It says, some of the non-traditional security issues, this is from Kogila Balakrishan, uh, some of the non-traditional security issues, especially the ones related to pollution caused by haze, right, from logging, destruction of flora and fauna in the corals, is actually critical, but receives less attention. What is being done at the ASEAN level, right, or by ASEAN and at the various multilateral forums exists in the region to address these issues. So on the one hand is pollution, uh, you know, air pollution, pollution on land and pollution on water, because I think, so maybe we'll get Margaret and Julius to, to respond to that being done at ASEAN uh, and other multilateral forums and what action is being taken. So maybe we turn to Julius first, we can talk about the impact on you know, pollution and the corals. I think this is related to what you mentioned earlier. Julius? Yeah. Okay. So I think ASEAN has, uh, by having a 
several frameworks of action and regional action plans on various environmental issues uh, are good indicators that ASEAN collectively recognize, recognizes the existence and, and uh, impact of these environmental problems, whether it's marine plastic pollution or coral, uh, corals, uh, coral degradation or overfishing. So yes, as, so ASEAN, uh, collectively recognize the existence of the, these problems. And at the same time, they recognize their limitations by uh, inviting or partnering with external partners in terms of capacity building. So there are, uh, if you review, there are many ASEAN documents that uh, specify the, the, the types of capacity building projects that are ongoing, uh, uh, that it, that helps uh, environmental officers from uh, at the top a bottom up approach to environmental protection. There are plenty of capacity building projects that can help Southeast Asian countries individually and collectively to address these uh, environmental problems, whether it's in the air air pollution or uh, ocean the health of our oceans. Margaret, you want to weigh in here? Yes, uh, so just to add on to what uh, Julius just mentioned, just to be more specific on um, some of the um, uh, initiatives that ASEAN has taken. So for example, for haze pollution, ASEAN already has an agreement on transboundary haze pollution signed in 2002. And then um, for the various environmental issues, ASEAN actually has uh, various working groups, uh, for example, working group on um, the coral and marine environment and on nature conservation and biodiversity. It also has ASEAN Center for Diversity, Biodiversity. It also has an initiative named um, ASEAN Heritage Parks, which has some marine components in it. So there, there are some ongoing um, initiatives already, uh, but I think as, as, as mentioned by Julius um, earlier, um, there is a need to recognize the nature of, 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 of cooperation and collaboration in, in ASEAN, which is mostly uh, to promote coordination, um, um, collaboration, uh, consultation uh, among member states. And, and in the end of the day, I think most of the things will be uh, 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 performed mostly by, by member states themselves. Uh, so here, here where we, I think we need to uh, be more realistic in, in, in terms of our expectations. Uh, as far as uh, uh, ASEAN flash multilateral cooperation is, is concerned. Uh, Thanks. Thank you for that. And it's actually uh, uh, another question that actually follows up through uh, the follows up the, the uh, responses that you've given. So there are a number of frameworks indeed, uh, regionally in, in Southeast Asia and the wider East Asia, and of course, globally. But what do you think are the factors? This is from Desia, Destia Norris. What do you think are the factors hindering a more solid global cooperation and collaboration, cooperation and collaboration to address global issues? Uh, I think all three can respond to this. You can, you know, you can talk about, you know, cooperation in, in uh, dealing with the pandemic, cooperation in dealing with uh, food security or health uh, or economic security, or all these cross-cutting issues. Shall we start with Louis? You know, factors uh, okay. you think are hindering global cooperation and collaboration. Yeah. Uh, on, okay. global uh, on collaboration uh, to address global issues. Um, thank you for that, the city. Uh, I feel that addressing these global issues is a public good, especially for the common good. Uh, but it's also because it's a global public good that it can be uh, underprovided at times. So uh, I think that one, one reason for uh, the lack of uh, collaboration or participation of countries is that they may take for granted that it will happen anyway, even if they did not uh, take part in the discussion. Uh, so that's one. Um, I think also that uh, the actors that are needed to be brought to the table have their own interests. And uh, that includes the private sector who may be the cause of uh, some of the environmental uh, challenges. So 
the key then is to align the incentive for the private sector towards uh, the, the global good or the global common good. Uh, a third factor, I think, uh, is the organization of civil society. Um, because civil society sometimes represents, let's say, like um, in the case of uh, uh, women, inequality, uh, poverty, development, these represent actors who have fewer resources. So uh, I think that there is a need to strengthen the capacities of civil society, uh, but that this will, I don't think this will happen by itself because there is a limited uh, economic incentive to do so. This will have to happen from a normative perspective based on the belief systems of people uh, and of societies as well. And the fourth factor, I guess, is maybe there is still a lack of uh, democracy in some places, because the ones who would benefit from these are the poorer, poorer individuals uh, and the disadvantaged sectors. So I think that functional democratic systems would allow for, uh, would push states towards more uh, cooperation. And in cases where they do not, maybe we can look at the levels of actual democracy in these countries. Thank you. Louis, thank you, Louis. Uh, Julius, got to weigh in here. <laughs> well, uh, hopefully we can find a solution to this uh, hindrance to global cooperation. I, maybe I think one uh, one factor that I can identify. Maybe we all agree is if national interests collide. Uh, so uh, there are many many intractable intractable global issues that require cooperation among uh, states, especially among the, you know, the G7 or G20, but uh, because of the, their competing national interests, it, it, it serves as hindrance. But uh, I don't want to lose hope because there are global issues that where I can see uh, cooperation can still uh, be uh, strengthened. Uh, for example, in my area, it's in nuclear, nuclear security for in, in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, geopolitical, there are geopolitical rivalries, rivalries in the region, but I can see that they are, are also collaborating on, for example, on the strengthening of nuclear security, on the peaceful uses of nuclear technology, because it's in everyone's interest to maintain that this nuclear technology will not be diverted into uh, malicious purposes. Thank you. And Margaret, you have the last word. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Prof. Well, I think um, the, the simple answer to the question, uh, although the reality will be ob obviously more complex than that, is because countries differ in their capacity to contribute. Um, countries have their specific situations, strengths, and limitations. So even though countries may, in principle, agree to uh, collaborate, for example, uh, climate change, Paris Agreement 2015, all countries, developed and developing countries alike say that, okay, we will uh, reduce our uh, uh, emissions. Uh, but, you know, uh, in, 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 uh, in practice, some countries need help uh, from uh, developed countries, they need money, and the money from developed countries uh, never come in the amount that they, uh, they pledged, for example. And why it is so, we don't know, right? I mean, it depends on you know, their national circumstances again, um, the, their constituencies, the people that uh, they support their agenda at the at the global level, the things like that. So basically, um, I mean, it, it goes down to uh, capacity to contribute, I think. Uh, so as much as, uh, as, as far as a multilateral collaboration is concerned, um, I think we can be hopeful as, as Julius is saying, um, but to, let's say, uh, see results 100% uh, in shortest time possible, that, that will be uh, a little bit uh, 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 far-fetched, <laughs> put it that way. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to, to all your questions and to the panelists for responding to them. And of course, for sharing their research to the audience that we have been able to gather this afternoon. 
Um, as, you, as you may already notice, um, the presentations this afternoon actually also um, is a, an, another avenue for the staff and researchers in the NTS Center to share their ongoing research. And we certainly hope that with this uh, sharing that we are able to address some of the critical common challenges that we face. Uh, we start with, of course, the, the, the problem facing us today, which is the pandemic. And we, of course, know that um, the, the critical importance of, of dealing with these issues. Um, and and uh, to the question about why is it, uh, you know, what, what stops countries from working together in spite of the very fact that the, the challenges that we face, whether it is dealing with this raging pandemic, dealing with the looming threat of, of climate change, uh, you know, the, the, the looming threat of food insecurity, and all the other cross-cutting issues, you know, it seems logical that countries should really work together. I think the, the factors that have been mentioned, you know, competing national interests, capacity, right, um, are, are, are issues that, that, you know, that are not new. And these have been problems that have plagued <laughs> the global community in coming together to address these issues. I, I cannot resist but mention in the context of the pandemic, you know, the, the issue of vaccines and vaccine nationalism, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's very, uh, as the, uh, the director general of, of the WHO has, has mentioned, you know, <clears throat> it is, he used the word grotesque, that some countries are actually now looking at, um, you know, vaccinating uh, the, the, the youth, which is very important agenda, but they're still, a uh, uh, large swathe of, of countries that do not even have access to vaccines. So the global inequity that faces us today, right? This will all have severe implications on all the issues that we have identified, whether it is pandemic, uh, you know, dealing with the health crises, uh, with the economic crisis, the food security crisis, climate change, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these are coming together but I guess as, as Julius has reminded, reminded us, and thank you for reminding us, Julius, and giving us hope that in spite of the real politique out there, that there are, in spite of all these competitions, there have been and are continuing to be examples of countries, in fact, working together. Uh, there's actually a question here, which I guess you can address uh, later on, uh, maybe by email. Uh, you know, are developing countries more at risk from NTS compared to more developed countries? Well, the quick answer is yes, right? <laughs> because uh, developed countries, of course, have better capacity, but at the same time, there are problems, uh, issues like pandemic, which does not differentiate whether you're rich or poor. The pandemic has been known to be a great equalizer, right? So with that, ladies and gentlemen, we really thank you for spending the time with us. As I said, there is another part to this webinar organized by the NTS Center. Uh, we shall let you know in due course the, the topics that we have and the schedule. So it leaves me now to thank you all uh, for joining us and good afternoon. <laughs>